Yes. Is, can you hear? Can you hear me with this mic? Louder. Okay. Just talk. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that better? Can you? Hear? Okay. Thank you. Um, welcome to the candidate forums tonight. My name is Colleen Feige. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Dinah. And the League of Women Voters of Dinah and Jewish Community Action are co-sponsoring this forum tonight. Um, the first forum runs from 7 till 8. And we have Dario Anselmo and Heather Edelson, who are running for the Minnesota House District 49A. At 8 o'clock, we will have um, Steve Elkins and Mac Sikich, I hope I said that correctly, um, uh, speaking from 8 until 9. Let me say a few words about the League of Women Voters before we start. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan volunteer organization which is committed to making democracy work for all. We do not endorse parties or candidates, but we do work to grow empower and protect the vote. And to grow the vote, this year the League of Women Voters of Dinah has registered hundreds of voters, including 150 students at Edina High School in May. Um, yes, <clears throat> that was great. Um, and to, protect, to empower the vote, we also do programs and events and candidate forms so that voters have information. And to protect the vote, we uh, support voter, um, voter um, registra not registration. Part, part, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Lost the word there. Um, but the most important thing is you folks. You are the voters. And as Steve Simon says, be a voter. Steve Simon is the Secretary of State for Minnesota, and he is always saying, be a voter. It's not just about registration. You've got to vote. So we will certainly echo that, that feeling, and we would encourage every one of you to vote on or before November 6th for this midterm election. And of course, we want you to vote in all elections so that we can really make democracy work. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Jerry Nelson, who is our moderator, sitting on the end there. Jerry is a member of the Anoka Blaine Coon Rapids League of Women Voters. Jerry, thank you, and it's to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, and thank you for coming here tonight. It's always good to see an overflow crowd. <clears throat> Um, before we get started, would you all please take out your cell phones or other electronic devices and make sure that they are on silent or turned off. Appreciate that very much. The purpose of tonight's forum is to provide an opportunity to hear the candidates for the Minnesota House of Representatives District 49A. These um, candidates will be discussing issues that are important to you. We will try to cover as many issues as we can fit in. And um, if your questions are not addressed tonight, feel free to contact the, the uh, candidates directly. All candidates who filed for office and are, will be on the November 6th ballot were invited, and they're both here tonight. Thank you. Let me explain the rules and the format for tonight's forum. Speaking order was determined um, before, before the forum by the League of Women Voters Edina and will rotate with each question. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement and two minutes for a prepared question that was sent out in advance. The candidates will then have one minute to answer each question submitted by the audience. Candidates will each have uh, two minutes to make a closing statement. The uh, league volunteers up in front here will be timing the candidate responses and will indicate to them when they have 45 seconds, 30 seconds, and 15 seconds remaining and when they must stop. Audience questions must be in writing and handed to a volunteer who is wearing a League of Women Voters button or a Jewish Community Action button. I will um, ask 
uh, all the que I will be asking all the questions. The League of Women Voters Edina uh, determines which questions will be asked and attempts in good faith to cover all the topics of interest that you um, indicate by submitting questions. All the written questions become property of the League of Women Voters Edina. The forum is being recorded, so please hold your applause until the end of the forum um, so that we have as much time for the candidates to speak as possible. Let me introduce to you the two candidates for State Representative District 49A. The, um, the order was determined randomly. Dario Anselmo and Heather Adelson. Welcome tonight. All right. Okay, let's start with our, our opening uh, statements for one minute. Uh, Dario Anselmo, you will start, please. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for doing the best job of saying my name ever at a public forum. Right, Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Dario Anselmo, and I'm running for re-election uh, to be your state representative. Uh, I've lived here in Edina for 20 years now with my wife, Jeannie, and our three kids that all attend the Edina Public Schools. I started my first business here in Edina when I was 21 years old, a computer distribution company. I later went on to take over and run a music club in downtown Minneapolis called the Fine Line Music Cafe, and I'm currently involved in commercial real estate. Um, a little bit of my background, I've been involved in civic activities for probably the last 35 years of my life. Uh, I was a, both a leader and a member of a number of those organizations. I started the Warehouse District Business Association and led that in downtown Minneapolis, was a part of the Minneapolis Downtown Council. I was also a member of the Mental Health Association of Minnesota, and I was the leader for 12 years and the president for the Bipolar Support Alliance. That along with being a uh, member of the Edina Education Fund Board when our son was in kindergarten, and he is now a senior, so that's been a very a long time along with the Ed Fund. Uh, more on these issues and the things that are important to me later. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Heather Edelson. My name is Edelson. Edelson. Sorry, Edelson. There it goes. Yes. Edelson, you got it right. My name is Heather Edelson, and I'm running for State House. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this tonight, and all of you for being here, and those of you that are watching on home and online. My husband, Brett, and I live in Edina, and our three little boys, Sam, Caleb, and Josh, attend our local neighborhood public school. My husband, who's just in the back row there, thank you for being here, honey, he, he uh, grew up in this community. So we've been in and out of, of, of Edina for a long time, but like many of you, we moved to Edina because the strong public schools. Edina is a great place to live for people of all ages. I am actually the first person to go to college in my family and went on to later to get a master's degree and become a mental health therapist. I truly believe that policies should be about people. I will be Edina's representative and will listen and advocate for people of all opinions to find common ground from students to seniors to from teachers to business leaders. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, the question that was sent out in advance is, what are your top priorities for the 2019 legislative, legislative session? And Heather Edelson, you will start, please, for two, two minutes on this. Yeah, well, anybody, oh, anybody that knows me knows that I care deeply about our senior population. We are expecting a large um, baby boomers are aging. And so ensuring that we have age-friendly communities, access to comprehensive health care, transit, uh, ensuring that we address uh, senior abuse is something that I absolutely care about. That would be a top priority for me. Um, also looking at economic opportunities. You, paid family leave is, is also it's a pro-business decision, but it's also pro-worker. And I think that it's a great... Great opportunity for us to uh, look into how to support families and, and businesses. Um, workforce training is also something uh, I would pursue. We know that we have a teacher shortage. Maybe not here in Edina, but across Minnesota we do. Um, and also, of course, I'm a mom. Sensible gun legislation is something I would like to see passed. I would work on a, a ban on bump stocks. There is no reason to have a magazine that shoots 400 bullets per minute. It is not safe. I can see that we have many parents in the audience. I think all of us would like to see overwhelmingly gun legislation addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Dario Anselmo, let's hear how, what your top priorities are for the next session. 
Thank you. I've got uh, six of those. We'll see if I can get through all of these here. Uh, as a small business person and having spent uh, 35 years in that field and really one of the few members at the Minnesota House of Representatives that has that sort of experience, I feel it's important that I continue to work on cutting red tape and making sure business operators, small business people uh, and large, are successful. Uh, I did that with the home mortgage origination bill that's just posted in today's uh, Sun Current. Education is a top priority for me. It was one of the three things that I ran on, having three kids in the schools and having spent 12 years advocating for that in Edina. Uh, I care about education so much, I serve on two committees at the Capitol. Uh, a couple things that I think we can do more, besides the funding that we provided, $1.3 billion of additional funding last session, is to come back and find a way how we can deal with the opportunity and the achievement gap. And that would be with some of the pre-K funding needs, and to do that in a targeted method that they talk in the close the gap by five, where we get those targeted dollars to families that need them. The environment is also a top priority. A number of people knew that I carried the legislation that talked about the stop of resulting in protecting our environment. That's a bill that I got passed through the House, and I look to come back next session to get the Senate and the Governor to be on board, and we'll get that one taken care of. Public health is also very important to me. I authored and got passed through the House and the Senate smoke and cessation funding legislation to help people quit smoking and to save tax dollars. I also introduced the first bill on Tobacco 21 to push the age of consumption and purchase of tobacco up to 21. Another top priority for me was gun violence. It was something that was difficult for me to talk about, having lost a parent to gun violence. And it's something that I was one of the first Republicans to both sign on as a co-author, lead efforts, and speak to students, to people, and our politicians about. And I plan to go back and work on that important issue. Another big thing for me is making government better. And that will be finding a way to take maybe our caucus system, get it to a primary system, find a way to make our, our, our politics work for people. And that is one of the six things that I'll work on when I'm there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dario, Dario will have you ask, answer the first audience question here. You'll have one minute for each of these. Uh, what will you do to work across the aisle so that gridlock does not happen? Well, for better or for worse, I'm a pretty good example of that. People thought I spent too much time on the other side of the aisle, uh, and that's the way it works for me. Um, and I think you know, finding ways where you can bring, and most of our legislation actually does have a bipartisan support to it, you know, it's the controversial issues, and it's building a base and then finding a way to pull people on board. And that was the case with the gun uh, legislation that was out there, uh, and trying to find and build a base with moderates. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, sometimes you get a lot of pressure from these advocacy groups, and that's difficult. And that's a little bit of why I'd like to see some reform uh, from a caucus to a primary system. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Heather Edelson, um, how will you work across the aisle so that gridlock doesn't happen? I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we heard, um, because in the last legislative session, there wasn't a lot done. And so what I know is that these legislators in St. Paul are not, they're not building the relationships that they once were. I can appreciate that there is some work happening there, but the reality is, is this was one of the last, 20, the, this last 2018 session was one of the most least unproductive sessions that we've had in quite a long time. Um, so we do know that this is a big issue. I will work hard because I will build relationships. As a therapist, I can tell you that if we want to get, we want to listen to the people that are across the aisle because their voices matter too. And in order to get things done, we have to compromise. And I, I realize that and I will work hard to do that. Thank you. Next question is, what will you do to keep voters informed during the session about what is happening at the legislature? Heather Edelson, you're first. You know, throughout my campaign, um, when I announced about a year ago, uh, I have been holding forums, I have been knocking on doors, I have been engaging our public as much as possible because I feel like good government engages the community. We may not always agree, and people from my own party and I do not always agree, and I say that that's okay because the reality is, is we need to have conversations, we need the forums that we've been hosting, we're hosting another one September 12th if you want to know about that on seniors, um, but we need to hold these forums which are essentially town halls, to make sure that our community members are talking to each other. We have so much division. And what I will say, we need to stop that. We need to start talking to each other again. We need to be committed. And I will be there for our community. Thank you. Dario Anselmo, how will you keep voters informed during this session? 
You know, I'll continue to, to do it the way I've done it most of my life. And when I was operating uh, my business in downtown Minneapolis, which was a hospitality business, is we found a way to always make sure we caught up and we greeted people. Uh, I've got a friend running for Congress that seems to be using the same theme, which is having coffee with people. Uh, and I do that a lot, whether I'm at Lund's or Jerry's. And it's having that direct contact. And it isn't just always the formal forum, uh, which I do often and I enjoy doing. Uh, using social media, which is not always the best tool. And it's a way for sometimes people to be fairly uncivil. And I think we have probably both have seen that at times from some of the comments. But it does allow us to have some feedback. But I think that continual voter contact is important. Uh, door knocking during campaign season is fine. But having that contact and meeting with people, I have to tell people I probably meet, from, meet with more people uh, than that didn't vote for me last session that probably did. So fortunately, that's only 49%, but that's good. Thank you. Um, how will you support small business, Dario Anselmo? Well, again, with the experiences and what I've had, and, and when we go and we pass laws, and I'll take some exception to, we did actually get a lot done last session, and it's a complete session. It's 2017, it's 2018. We did a lot of bonding. We did a lot of funding. I serve on some of those committees like education where we spend a lot of money, and we try to spend it well. With businesses and regulations, it's key to make sure you understand the unintended consequences. Um, and it's amazing. There's 4,000 laws you know, you know, per session they could propose. We need to make, to make sure those are the right ones. And again, going through and cutting red tape is something that I get and something that we need to, need to do more of. Heather Edelson, how will you support small business? I think one of the best ways that we can support small business in our community, which we have a, a, th a thriving small business community, is to make sure that we have an educated workforce. And so really looking at that will be one of the primary ways that I will be supporting a small business in the future. Thank you. Um, Heather, we'll continue with you with um, education funding has not kept up with inflation. What can be done to address this? Education funding is, is a constant issue at, uh, at the Capitol. And we know that health and human services, health care, and education cover about 71% of the budget in St. Paul. And what we know is that we've seen cuts. Here in Edina, we saw um, a little over, I think it was $1.6 million cut. And one of the things that gets cut is special education. So we do know that funding is a big issue. We have to figure out how to partner um, possibly with um, this is actually a bipartisan issue too. Like, we, it becomes a partisan issue at the Capitol when really funding our kids' schools, education, the best education, supporting our teachers, this should be bipartisan. But unfortunately, in St. Paul, it's not right now. So what I will do is I will work with Republicans, I will work with Democrats to make sure that we have good conversations on why public education is one of the best invest investments as a community that we can make. Thank you. <clears throat> Dario? Um, how are you going to keep education up with inflation? Uh, it's a good question. I guess you always have to know what is that baseline that you're, uh, you're looking at. Last session, we spent $1.3 billion in addition to the money that we spent uh, over above that. So that's you know, a total of $16 billion is spent on education. It's a lot of money. It's $500 million over the base inflation level. So we did actually spend more last session, how you add it up. You need to make sure it's effective and where that money goes. You know, over the last 25 years, it's been 30% more than inflation. So it's a totality. We need to make targeted investments in education. We need to do early education in communities that need that. And we need to make sure that we're making those investments. Here in Edina, we have a little better ability to bond and to, and to get those additional funds that we need. Um, but we do need to keep up. But they need to be measured and accountable results. All right. Um, as a legislator, how, would you, how will you improve health care access to all Minnesotans, regardless of their background? And Dario, would you start, please? Well, we actually have uh, very good health care access uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and whether it's the ACA or the other programs that are out there, we have a number of employer programs that people are part of. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a supporter for the Medicaid for all uh, type approach. I think we do need to have some markets. We need to have more price transparency. Uh, both in prescription drugs as well as medical services because the costs are, are unsustainable. Last session, we actually did find a way to make it more affordable for people like us that are you know, individual prov provider payers to actually have their rates go down for the first time. And it'll continue policies like that that help people have access and have affordability. Thank you. Heather Edelson, as a legislator, how will you improve health care access to all Minnesotans regardless of their background? I'm a strong believer in the Minnesota Care Buy-In option. Um, 
you know, I grew up very different than how we live now. Uh, I had to, I actually used Minnesota Care at one point. What I would say is Minnesota Care buy in families need relief now. And actually, going back to the small business, door knocking in our district, I will tell you, so many of our small business people have told me that insurance for them is really hard. If you're if your loved one needs a surgery, they are paying sixty sometimes thousand for insurance. So, you know, we look at what happened with reinsurance. Reinsurance was a band-aid. It's something that we had to do, but Minnesota Care Buy-in is an option. It's an affordable option, and it's actually a fiscally responsible option for us to get good insurance to take care of the people of Minnesota. All right. Let's have another question on, on a new topic here. Do you support the state of Minnesota allowing the city of Edina to use TIF financing for the Edina lid over Highway 100. Why or why not? <laughs> Heather Edelson, please start. You know, so I've actually I've heard a little bit about the lid. There's a <laughs> green lid. Yeah, yeah. There's a, so I think that there's um, in the community right now there's a little bit of a split. Um, what I would say is you know TIF is used very frequently in different communities. In fact, TIF has been used here in Edina numerous times with Southdale and um, looking at oh, Centennial Lakes. And Centennial Lakes is an amazing place where we are able to have people of all ages uh, come together. Now in terms of of would I support legislation? Is that what it asked? Um, you know, really what I would say is I would work with our local city, city council. I would work with the people of Edina to find a common sense solution of what we actually want. For What does the city want? What does the council want? I truly do believe in local control, though. In terms of these things, the city council is up for election. I mean, when I look at what happened, I wanted to have plastic ba uh, bags banned from the city of Edina. And what we have is a, a preemption bill that stops us from being able to do that. If we would, if we would have that preemption, Bill, we wouldn't even be able to do Tobacco 21. So I think that we need to know where our priority, priorities are. Dario Anselmo, how do you weigh on, on this issue? Uh, well, one of the things I get to do is get to work on those issues, uh, you know, being the current representative. And I worked with our senator, uh, Senator France, on the other side of that. And we kind of authorized and put that legislation uh, up and have it ready uh, if the people in Edina want that. Uh, and it's very clear that they don't want that. Um, I've talked to the people at the city about that, that you need to do a better job of explaining this to the people. Um, and at this point, I would say no. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, the most cost-effective strategy for getting cars, cars off the road is construction of light rail. It's good for the environment, helps seniors as it's more reliable, and, and increased mobility for seniors. Uh, will you support it? Why or why not? And Dario Anselmo, you're first. Uh, I've been a supporter of multimodal transportation, and so light rail is part of that package uh, for the last 25 years when I was with the Minneapolis Downtown Council. Um, you know, looking at the cost of it, where it's gone from there to now, uh, it does make it a little bit tougher. Uh, but I have to say, gradually, if we can get the federal funding and they can find an effective way to do it, uh, and there's problems in Minneapolis with it more so than there are out here in the suburbs, uh, I would be supportive of having that. Uh, but it's got to be cost effective. It's got to be done right. Uh, and I still do have concerns or reservations. Thank you. Heather Edelson, how do you feel about light rail? I believe we're talking about the Southwest light rail. Um, absolutely, I'm in support of it. I, 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 looking at this, we, we cannot pave our way out of this problem. We are going to be adding, over the next three decades, nearly a million people to, the, to, Minia, to Minnesota. And so we have to look at different ways people can transport themselves. Buses are great. I think that's a good way. Southwest light rails. And in fact, uh, many large business owners are in support of Southwest light rail because they know that this is going to be a great way for their for them to have their employ the employees come to uh, come to their city, so uh, very much in support of it. Thank you. All right, uh, Heather. Uh, if you disagree with your caucus on important issues, what will you do in order to get legislation passed that will help Edina? So. Uh, in terms of, of uh, disagreeing with my caucus, I would say, you know, I'm a moderate Democrat. I think there's many fiscal issues that I may disagree with my caucus on. Um, I think that we could, uh, you know, we don't have to be so quick to say no, uh, property tax relief and things like that. So um, I would work really hard because the reality is, is my focus as your representative would be on the people of Edina and making sure that we get things done for you. Mario, uh, how do you feel about that? 
Well, I've done a, a pretty good job, I guess, of, uh, of uh, resisting both my caucus and sometimes people at the, at the city. As the only elected Republican and actually the whole inner ring of the metro and the only inner, inner ring um, here in Edina, or actually elected official in Edina, you know, I am that one voice that says, you know, no. Uh, and it's not always easy. And so I'll continue to do that both with our city if needed. I'll work with our city. Uh, and certainly in our caucus, you know, if I need to go to a sit-in, I'll even do that too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Minnesotans are dying from opioids. What legislation do you support to solve this health crisis? Dario Anselmo. Could you repeat that I first sure will. question? Um, Minnesotans are dying from opioids. What legislation do you support to solve this health crisis? Uh, thank you. I actually was one of the uh, lead co-authors. There were three of us uh, on the bill uh, with Representative Dave Baker, uh, who's a friend and a colleague who lost his son to that. Uh, and our legislation was basically looking to uh, authorize money and grants so we could have a prescription management program for doctors to use so you could sort of control and limit the supply. Uh, there's also some work on and getting a funding mechanism to help pay for some of the education, the prevention, and the treatment. Uh, and I will be there with uh, Representative Baker uh, helping champion the, this important cause. I lost a dear friend uh, that I worked with for 10 years uh, to an opioid addiction. And he was a suburban kid, uh, went to uh, the schools around here, uh, and it's a very painful and, and very important thing. We're losing 400 people a year to opioid addiction and abuse. Heather, what would you do at the legislature to solve the opioid crisis? You know, I'd just like to inform everyone here on what happened in the last legislative session. There was an opioid uh, bill that came up. It was going to be a penny a pill taxed on pharma companies, or it was going to be a fee. And what happened when it came to the, the House floor for a vote, all of it, it had support. It had bipartisan support. And it, the pharma, ph pharmaceutical companies came in to the Capitol, they came into St. Paul, and all of a sudden, it lost steam. And then the money, which was going to be coming from the pharmaceutical companies, which had given us misinformation in the first place, it was going to be coming from our general fund. So the taxpayers were going to be paying for something that the reality is, is the pharmaceutical companies need to have a, some ownership over of the misinformation they were giving to doctors. So I would, first of all, I would, I would stand for that fee. And uh, I would tell you that no lobbyist will push me around in terms of making sure that we deal with the opioid epi epidemic. Thank you. <clears throat> what should the government do with regards to supporting people with special needs, such as mental illness, seniors aging in place, special education, et cetera? It's kind of a, what's the, the role of government in these issues? Heather Edelson. <laughs> As I said before, we have a very large population of seniors, um, baby boomers that are aging, and we know that we need to take care of them. Um, one of the things that I would like to see, so my father-in-law um, passed away two years ago from Alzheimer's, um, and when we went in to look for facilities for him, what we know is nursing homes have report cards here in the state of Minnesota. And now they're not the best because the, they're only these facilities and nursing homes are only reviewed every 30 days. Assisted living facilities, however, Ever, where we have more nursing home, more people going into nurse or uh, assisted living facilities, they're going there, but we do not have a report card on them. So we're leaving fa to families. They're going into these facilities and they're check they're looking at the lights, they're looking at the staff. We don't know how high that the staff turnover is. We don't know what the employees are being paid. And I would also the second thing is I would look at the pay structure for how we are supporting people that take care of our most vulnerable population because we need to take care of our seniors. Thank you. Dario Anselmo, you want me to repeat this or? Uh, go ahead. What should the government do with regards to supporting people with special needs, such as mental illness, seniors aging in place, special education, and so on? Uh, a lot of things to say here in a minute. Um, I think with our seniors that we need to continue to do, which is what we're doing, which is funding those programs. Uh, the outside legislators uh, auditor's office came up with a series of recommendations that we actually did implement, which is good. There's some misleading uh, advertising that's uh, coming out there, unfortunately, from my opponent's party on that subject. Uh, to mental health, it's something that's very important, as I talked about, having spent 25 years uh, in that area, we need to be funding that. Um, and it's at all levels. It's even at the, uh, at the school age level, where I... Uh, it sought funding for, uh, it was vetoed, to help students with suicide prevention training by teachers. So we need to do things at all levels, uh, and uh, certainly with special education. You know, funding that cross-subsidy gap, the amount of money we don't get from the federal government that we have to make up for at the state government is something that we do need to address. Thank you. 
Okay, here's one that's um, controversial. Do you support trained and qualified teachers carrying guns in school? Why or why not? Dario Anselmo, you start. Uh, I do not support that. I don't support uh, you know guns in anywhere near kids unless it's there with a licensed uh, police officer. Thank you. How do you feel about that, Heather? As a mom, I'm strongly opposed. What I think that we need to do is make sure that we have we pass gun legislation and we get it a House floor hearing. So um, very much opposed to that. But unfortunately, we do have a governor gubernatorial candidate in Minnesota that is for something like that. So um, just make sure you know who your governor candidates are. Thank you. Okay, Heather, um, affordable housing seems like an issue that receives bipartisan support. What can the legislature do to ensure all Minnesotans have a home? Mm -hmm. You know, actually, the Sun Current just came out with an article uh, today talking about affordable housing. We have um, an avid uh, advocate here in our community, Hope Melton, who is just really working on this issue. But it's a coalition of people in Edina that really care about it. Uh, but what I would say is we need to approach housing and it, like infrastructure. It is a it's a necessity. Um, I was taking an Uber, and this man, this young man, I said, is this what you do for a full-time job? And he says, you know, yes, and I can can, still cannot make enough. And so what he has to do is he pays to live at Mary's place. And so we as a community have to figure out where our values are. What we know is if people have housing, their health their their health is better. They're not there's less emergency room visits and also our crime rates go down. So it is a good investment for Minnesotans to invest in affordable housing. Dario Anselmo, how do you feel about affordable housing or ensuring all Minnesotans have a home? I think this is the part where I say I'm pro affordable housing. And I will continue from there. Uh, I actually have uh, participated in the, uh, in the coalition here uh, locally that's led. Uh, and I also uh, the, the supported the, the housing bonding that happened last session. Um, but, you know, and that was House File 4425, I believe. $197 million was put out there in a variety of affordable housing uh, packages. So uh, we are doing some work on that. There's always more that's needed. And affordable housing needs to be affordable for, uh, you know, at all levels like this. And it has to get down to builders. It gets back to a little bit of regulations and cutting through that. So you'll see that these groups that represent the builders and trades associations, um, they also support affordable housing. Uh, but there are multiple ways uh, to doing it. It isn't just always writing a big check. We did, and we need to continue to support that effort. All right. Um, will you keep the increase percent in government spending equal to the cost of living increase? Let me say that again. Will you keep the increase percent in government spending equal to the cost of living increase, increased percent? Why or why not? Dario, you first. I'm not uh, for putting any budget uh, on autopilot uh, and having it go extremely out of control. Uh, I think we need to meet the needs of what the people are. And we need to find a way to make it affordable, uh, just like we need a tax structure that supports it. It needs to support growth so you can meet those needs. So I'm not for an automatic anything. I think you need to do the work and do the budget. Okay. Heather, how do you feel about that? Well, I think it goes to what we just talked about is to this housing issue. What we know is that we have a housing epidemic and people are not being able to afford um, to, let, to, to rent and to be able to be successful, live successfully in our communities. And so um, I would, it's something I would absolutely look at. All right. Thank you. Um, let's look at a, an Edina question here. One of the biggest news events in Edina over the last year was when our public schools were attacked by an outside political group in mailings and in the press. For those of us with, with kids proudly in Edina schools, including both of you, this was a very significant event. And it certainly was the same for Edina teachers, staff, and administrators. If our schools are attacked again by politically motivated people from outside the district, from either the right or the left, what would your response be as our state representative? And Heather, you're first on this one. You know, when that attack happened, I, on our community, it, there was a magazine that many of our Edina residents received from the Center for American Experiment. And what I can tell you is 
my heart dropped because saying that we have indoctrination and things like this in our schools, attacks on our schools, I will not tolerate. And a lot of them actually, in fact, didn't even have kids in the public schools. So what I will tell you is I sit on the United Ed Fund board. I was on PTO just last year. I am constantly in our schools. I'm proud to have Ed Minnesota's endorsement. I will not allow our schools or our district to be tarnished in any way with falsehoods. Thank you, Dario Anselmo. What do you think about this? Um, well, I think it was unfortunate to have that sort of publicity you know, brought to our Grady Donna schools. Um, but I think it's also important always to look at you know how things are happening at the school. And I think after the election of President Trump, um, there were some activities that caught some people's attention and that they maybe should have been dealt with better. I'm confident that the administration, the teachers, and our new school board is looking firmly at that. But I just you know just don't think you can just circle the wagons and go. You don't have something to talk about and to think about. Um, I have to say that I'm not supportive of that. Uh, when it was brought to my attention, actually at, at the elementary school where our kids attended at Highlands Elementary. You know, I wrote a letter uh, to the families and the teachers and the support people to let them know that their state representative, a fellow parent, supports their efforts and their hard work. I, I also spent a lot of money bringing donuts to all the schools, um, and, and that's something that I'll continue to do if I, if I don't run out of campaign funds. Thank you. If anything, what, if anything, should be done to change the legislator's practice of rolling many separate bills into an omnibus <coughs> bill? sometimes called a garbage bill. Dario Anselmo, what is your um, idea on this? Well, being, uh, being from the party of less government is more, uh, I think we need to do a lot less of that stuff. Uh, and having less laws would be one of the ways to sort of do that. And it seems to be uh, a big problem for everyone's there. In the, in the shorter sessions, that's what happens. They make them into these big super omnibus bills. In the longer session, which is coming up next session, they are all separated. You end up with 12 separate bills. So it depends on which session you're talking about. But I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of hiding things and tucking it in there and making it easier to do more government. Um, that's my role and that's what Republicans do. Thank you. Heather, what do you think about this, these garbage bills? I think they're garbage. So, you know what I think, you know what it is more than anything? I think it is we elect representatives to go to St. Paul to do work for us. If I get elected in November, I work for you. And the reality is, is we need to make sure we're passing legislation that's going to help Minnesotans. Unfortunately, because of the 980-page bill, there was a lot of things that were very controversial in there, and nothing got done. We look at this last legislative session, the opioid epidemic. Nothing got done. You, you, you think about these, you know, actually, in talking about the seniors, the senior uh, reports, that, or the senior uh, bill that, that, that was going to address legislation, honestly, it didn't go far enough. AARP had suggested recommendations, and that did not go far enough. And so nothing got done, and I will stand against those, and I hope that actually that will have bipartisan support. Thank you. Um, Heather, you'll start on this one. How will you support clean, sustainable energy in Minnesota? Well, clean energy is a really big issue. I was really proud to help um, with Megan O'Hara, R.T. Rybeck's wife, um, actually came and worked with the Energy and Environment Commission. Carolyn Jackson's here. She's on it. Um, and worked really hard. We brought Edina its first solar garden. It's being built now. And listen, this is a community solar is a great way for us to bring, to have control over our own energy. And we need to see more of that. Um, I would also love to love us to see us outsource some of our um, clean, so we can actually export it to places like Chicago or things like that. So I think that there's a real industry here. It would be good for business. And I will be a big supporter of, of expanding wind and solar. Thank you. Dario, what do you think about clean, sustainable energy? How would you support it? Uh, well, I love clean energy. Uh, I love all energy. It's what drives our economy, uh, and I'm a big proponent of it. Um, I actually have 30 solar panels on my home. Um, it's actually got a great break-even break point if people are looking at doing that. It's a five-year break-even at this point. Uh, but part of it is is that you can get it out there, but you need a market to support that, and it now is doing that, and it's doing it with wind. Um, but nuclear and natural gas are part of that, too. So we just sort of can't be uh, energy uh, selective. We've got to look at all of the clean energy sources. But uh, you know, policies that help that are important. Important. Uh, I think some of the mandates that are out there uh, were a good idea to get started, but I'm not sure if that's what's going to make it sustainable. Uh, but I'm happy to see that Minnesota has been a leader in that, and I'll continue to be a proponent for clean energy in all the ways that I have and can continue to be. Thank you. 
Uh, the Supreme Court's Citizen United decision allows unlimited corporate and union campaign contributions and dark money from unidentified donors. The decision also precludes Congress from putting limitations on campaign financing. Do you support a constitutional amendment to overturn that decision? Why or why not? Dario Anselmo, you're first. I have to first say that this is actually is a federal issue. So, uh, yeah, when I'm running for Congress someday, uh, I'll do something about it. Uh, right now, my friend Dean Phillips is doing that, and, and he's not wanting to take any of that PAC money uh, and, and doing that. And I think that's uh, that's a good idea. You know, here locally, I'll have to say, and looking at the last campaign re uh, finance report, I took $500 from PACs and lobbyists. My opponent took you know, five thousand dollars. So I'm not saying that you know, you know, you're in the swamp, but you can probably see it. Uh, and we need to make sure we don't do that. You know, you know, the limits that we have here are about ten thousand dollars. So it's pretty minimal here. Thank you, Heather Edelson. Let me just clarify that the PACs are teachers' unions and uh, carpenters and people that actually want to make sure that we don't take away their ability, ability to organize. And so I'm very proud to take that money. And so in terms of the Supreme Court justice decision, um, I, you know, he actually alluded to, uh, Dario alluded to, there's negative mail that's gone out. I would love to see it. I'm running a positive campaign. I have not sent any of those mailers. I had nothing to do with them. I knew nothing about it. And so in terms of those, is, um, yes, I would like everybody to stay out of our race. This is a local race that between Dario and myself we could handle, but unfortunately we cannot do that. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions here on the same topic I'm going to combine into one. What will your role be to improve access to women's comprehensive health care? And should insurance companies be required to provide coverage for contraception? Why or why not? Um, Heather? Edelson, you're first. You know, this is a really good question because the last legislative session, absolutely, first of all, I will be a huge proponent on women, women's reproductive rights, their health care. Um, I am a breast cancer survivor, so I will tell you, um, I absolutely think that we need to plan that even as a 37, oh, actually, I was 34, as a 34-year-old woman, I wasn't going to predict that I was going to have breast cancer at 34. It's not as common. But there was an amendment, a Drakowski amendment, that went on the floor um, that was voted Voted on, and unfortunately, it would have really limited rights on, on things like cancer treatment. And you know, I, it's unfortunate that these things become so partisan. It was an a la carte insurance system, and um, and I think Dario, you might have voted for that. Okay, did you, Dario? You remember? We'll have, to, we'll, have to, we'll have to check the record. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I'm supportive of, of having a health care access, and certainly for all uh, you know, women's issues. And I don't have to say that's because I have a wife or I have a daughter. Uh, it, it's the right thing to do. And I'm supportive of people having access to health care, uh, to, uh, to contraceptive, uh, and all those sort of methods. So no question about that. Thank you. What should government do to reduce tobacco usage by youth? Dario Anselmo. Uh, well, well, we'll do what I uh, what I what I started out doing, and, and we had great momentum. Again, we got funding for the cessation aspect of it, and then unfortunately, it did, uh, it didn't get passed uh, by our governor. Uh, and then trying to find a way to do it statewide. I said there's a few places that I believe where government needs to play, uh, you know, a significant role. It's in public safety and it's in public health. Uh, and when you look at 6,000 people a year dying from tobacco-related illnesses, and you look at you know three billion dollars in hard costs, another four billion dollars in lost productivity, it's something that we need to do with. So. Having that law and making it be a statewide, uh, you know, raising up a level is something I support, and that's what I was doing. Thank you. Heather, what should government do to reduce tobacco usage by youth? You know, I think that this, I remember growing up, it was right after the um, tobacco settlement that we had, and there was all these great commercials saying, don't smoke, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, that money's running out, and there's just not enough funding anymore. So what I, one thing I will say I'm proud of is I did help with the Tobacco 21, passing it here in Edina. We were the first one in the city, our first one in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Mayor Hovland, for that. You're here. Um, but, you know, what I would say is vaping is one of our biggest issues. These kids nowadays are not smoking typical cities cigarettes. What we know is that they're vaping in the high schools. And so we have to figure out, first of all, because they think it's healthy, how do we make sure, we need data. We need to find out what are the, what's the health you know, costs that these kids are going to pay. And in 10 years, we may know, but I think that we need to find some research now and we need to make sure that we're educating our youth that this is not, it's still nicotine um, and it's not something we want them to do. 
Thank you. <clears throat> okay, here's, an, here's one that came up at our candidate <coughs> forum last night I in, in Andover. Do you support the dismantling of the Met Council? Why or why not? Heather Edelson. <laughs> You know, the Met Council provides such an incredible resource to our communities. It really looks at how regionally we can do things for the state of Minnesota. And breaking those up, these people that are appointed to um, the council, they are not up for election, so things are not necessarily political, which I will tell you is really <laughs> refreshing when we have people just looking out for the best interests of our communities. Um, so are, could there be some reforms? Sure, but the reality is, is they're doing really good work and I'm very supportive of the Met Council. Dario Anselmo, how do you feel about the Met Council? Uh, the Met Council, uh, which was started a number of years ago by a group of Republican mayors, uh, has morphed and changed and its scope has is, is increased greatly. Um, and I think if you're going to have the support of the people for that, um, you need to have reforms to that. So I'm absolutely 100% in support of that. I've met with the, uh, the chair, I've met with some of the members, and I don't think that they disagree with that. Uh, but uh, I'm supportive of, of change. I'm not. I'm not for dismantling it. Um, but I'm for fixing it. There's there's better models, and for some reason, we've not been able to do that. Okay. Um, has government has government ever helped you in a time of need, specifically when and how? Dario Anselmo. Uh, I would guess that would be uh, my public education. So uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it has. I'm, I'm sure if there is uh, public safety and other things uh, that have been in there uh, that have helped me, and I appreciate uh, the safety net uh, that our government provides, and it's, uh, it, it's really important. Thank you, Heather Edelson. How about, how about you? You know, my whole life, you know, I told you I'm the first one to go to college in my family. My whole life I hid from being poor because if you know anybody that's <laughs> poor, we, we feel a lot of shame about it. We really do. We just want to fit in. We just want to be successful and want nobody to know. But yes, absolutely. Have, has the government helped me? They helped with my public education like they did with Dario. But they helped with, you know, we talk about transit. MnDOT, I took the public transit system my entire life until I was 16 and be able to buy my own car. Um, Medicaid, without that, um, my family, I don't know what would have happened, but I believe in those support systems and uh, I'm very grateful. Okay, um, let's see, I'm trying to read this next question here. Um, yeah, you were the second one on that one, right? Okay, Heather, do senior facilities need more regulation or more enforcement of current regulations? If so, what specifically should be done, and if not, why not? You know, I think I mentioned it before, um, you know, protecting our seniors is one of the most important things that we are going to be able to do in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I did talk about the nursing home report card. I think that we actually need to do better on that. Um, I think that we need to have an assisted living uh, report card so that we are helping families. Um, I mean, that's government's job. It's to make your life easier. And so um, those are two areas that I absolutely believe in and will work really hard on. Dario, do, do senior facilities more, need more regulation or more enforcement of current regulations? What should be done? Well, again, I was happy that the outside letter shotter's uh, recommendations were taken, uh, and I'll also do a little bit of kind of fact correcting. You know, ARP made some uh, greater uh, sort of demands initially, and they did dial those back. Um, so, and I think that they understood that you want to be careful that you don't regulate uh, you know, certain businesses out of business because then you won't have a supply of those that are out there. So, you know, I want to make sure that we take care of those things, that we're diligent, um, that we take care of these things, but we need to be uh, very smart about that. And it's great that we've got committees, we've got professionals that are still looking at further things that we can do. Uh, but it was good to do the first round of it. If we need to do more, we need to do more. But, you know, don't regulate things out of business. It's tempting, but it just doesn't end well. Okay, here's this next question. Medicaid and Minnesota care payments are the largest item in the Minnesota budget. The health plans have not been audited with paid claims data for over 27 years. These audits are required annually by the federal government. Would you support auditing the health plans? Why or why not? Dario, you're first. 
Uh, in terms of looking what the uh, the actual budget totals are and all that, too, I always see that education is actually the top expenditure uh, mm -hmm. in our state. And, I, again, that's both uh, regular K-12 as well as higher education. Uh, but, yes, we do need to audit uh, things. We do need to hold people accountable. Uh, these are dollars, and these are important. And, and on the private sector part, if they're nonprofits, um, uh, yes, absolutely. Heather, what, how do you feel about auditing health care? Absolutely. I think that we should be auditing pretty much most things that we can, we're paying for with tax, tax dollars. So absolutely, I would. All right. Uh, should there be ranked choice voting options for cities and school districts like Edina? Why or why not? Heather. You know, I, I've met with Ginny Massey about this, who has really led the movement on ranked choice voting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm toward on it. I, 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 I could see the benefits of it, absolutely. Um, so I would be open to exploring it. How do you feel, Dario? Uh, I've met with a, a number of uh, people in there. I have to say I'm not sure if I'm super impressed the way it's worked uh, in, in Minneapolis. And uh, I'd have to say that, you know, I can make it pretty clear cut. I'm not in support of it. I think this might be the last question here. Um, how will you lower health care costs for Edina families? Do you support a single payer system? Why or why not? And Dario, you're first on that. Uh, I do not uh, support a single payer system, uh, and I think you know some of the things we've talked about earlier. You know, the reinsurance was a was a bit of a band aid, but you know we, we did need to do that to try to stabilize the markets. Uh, investing in more transparency. Uh, I was reading a story the other day about some of one of the biggest contributors to healthcare costs are emergency room visits. Uh, and in the state of Maryland, uh, they've actually put a cap of 125 percent of base services on that because if you're in plan or out of plan. So there are things that we can do, and we need to look at what other states have done. Hey, Heather, how do you feel about um, lowering health care plans or costs, and do you support single-payer system? You know, it's interesting. I just met with the nurses today, um, the nurses' union, and I am not in favor of, you know, first of all, single-payer looks very different, and the definition is very different to many people. Um, at this time, I'm not in favor of single-payer. I Right now, what I would say is my solution to really driving down costs would be to look at the Minnesota Care Buy-in. I think it's a system that we already have set up. I think it makes sense for us to expand it, and it's providing you know affordable relief for families, which is what we want to do. And, you know, Dario brings up a good point in terms of emergency room visits. Again, it's a housing issue. Um, so I would absolutely be supportive of a Medicare buy-in. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. We've gotten to a ton of questions tonight. So I really thank you for your, your concise answers. And um, uh, I think it's gone very well. Um, so I'm, I invite you now to make your closing statements. You have two minutes. And Heather, you'll be first. Some of the the contrast uh, between my opponent and myself. Um, listen, I like Dario. We're chatting up here before. This isn't when we're from two different parties. It is not that we dislike the candidate. The reality is, is we live in a small community. But the but the reality is, is we need to elect someone that's going to go to St. Paul and caucus with with a party that's going to actually get things done in terms of gun legislation, making sure that we can have a, you know access to affordable health care. And this is for small businesses too, making sure that we're addressing the needs of our community for seniors. Um, so in terms of moving forward, I would love to have your vote in November, um, and I look forward to. To, uh, you know what the future brings. Thank you. Dario Anselmo, your closing statement, please. Thank you, and thank you to the group here, and thank you to, uh, to Heather for, uh, for, uh, for being up here with me and participating in this process. It's very important, uh, and you can see that two people from two different parties and philosophies can get along uh, very well. Um, you know, what I plan to do is to, to go back and use my 35 years of business and civic experience, uh, to use my energy and my ability to connect with people, uh, and use that passion for helping our state and helping our community. Unfortunately, it seems like people have lost the ability to disagree without being disagreeable. I find that very troubling. Uh, I grew up in a very politically divided family. My dad was a Democrat. My mom was a Republican. Uh, she also helped raise a family of seven kids in a blended family. Uh, so I know firsthand what it's like to grow up in a politically divided house. Uh, Senator John McCain, in his recent farewell letter, encouraged all Americans to break free of this tribalism that's going on right now. And it's toxic, and it's a problem. We need to find a way to unite 
our shared values and our concerns to help our country, our state, and our city. Uh, my purple message, as I've talked about in my campaign, is really about bringing red and blue together and finding a way to solve solutions uh, and problems. I want to make sure that I put people and principles over politics. Uh, I was reading uh, a book the other day from one of my favorite authors. I'm in a book club. I know my opponent doesn't think that Republicans read books. We do. <laughs> we just do it much slower. <laughs> and in that book, he paraphrased something from Abraham Lincoln, uh, who talked about tapping into our better angels. And if you elect me, I will go back and I will work on that. And I would be happy to do that next November. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for participating in this forum and for your willing, willingness to participate in government uh, in the democratic pro process. It's so important um, for all of us that you're willing to do this. Thank you to the League of Women Voters, Edina, and the Jewish Community Action for sponsoring this uh, forum. The forum has been videotaped and will be made available in a number of ways, so listen carefully. Um, Comcast sub subscribers uh, will be on channel 813 for high definition and channel 16 standard definition. Edina TV is available to CenturyLink Prism subscribers on channel tw 1236 high definition and channel 236 standard defini definition. The forum will also be available for viewing on the League of Women Voters Edina website, uh, lwvedina.org and uh, on the city of Edina's website, edinamn.gov, and on YouTube. There's no excuse for not watching this forum. <laughs> Tell your friends. Thank you for attending tonight's program, and uh, remember to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. This concludes the forum for the Minnesota House of Representatives, District 49A. And in a few minutes, we will continue with District 49B. Thank you so much and good night.